Welcome back, boys and girls, to the first unit in second semester. We're going to be looking at classification of animals in this first unit, and then we'll be moving into the animal and plant kingdom during the rest of the semester. For more than three and a half billion years, life on Earth has been constantly changing. Processes like natural selection have led to st a staggering diversity of organisms. Biologists have identified and named about one and a half million different species so far. Think about that one. That's a lot. But they estimate that there are anywhere between two and a hundred million additional species yet to be discovered. And scientists and biologists also estimate that there are some species that are becoming extinct before we even discover them. Yeah, it's amazing. So let's look at how biologists keep all of this organized. Get your paper ready. Remember, wide right, skinny left. Take your notes in the right hand side however you want to take your notes. Outline, narrative, whatever. Okay, leave the left hand column for later. I'll remind you of that at the end. See you on the next slide. If someone asked you if you would like a tonic, would you expect this can of Coke? Not me. What if someone offered you a pop, a soda, a Coke? We have different names for the same thing, and it often leads to some amusing confusion. But in the biological world, confusion is not amusing. Life is very diverse and we have a need to make sense of it. If you think about how things are arranged in and around your house, chances are very good that you have several classification systems in place. A classification system allows for the naming and grouping of items in a very logical manner. Okay, so think about the things around your house. Your kitchen is probably very organized. We'll talk more about that in class. Systematics is the grouping of organisms in a way that's universally accepted and it's based on looking at their common traits. And that's what we're going to be focusing on in this section. This is done by continuously breaking down large groups into smaller and smaller and smaller groups based on traits and we're going to be talking more about that in class. Let's take a look a little bit more carefully at this science. Take a look at this picture. What would you call this animal? We might call it a mountain lion around here. If you lived in Florida, you would call it a panther. If you lived in the western US, you would call it a puma. Who's correct? The right answer is everybody. Common names vary from place to place, just like we saw with the can of brown carbonated soda. Okay, I call it pop, someone else calls it soda, someone else calls it coke. We all mean the same thing. When I say the word buzzard, if I was in Great Britain, people would think of this bird. It's not what we think of though. Here in the good old USA, we think of some somebody that looks, or a bird that looks like this, this turkey vulture. Both the hawk and the turkey vulture are very different from each other, but the term buzzard really doesn't have a technical definition, so everybody's right. However, back in the 1700s, someone would have called this bird, this animal, bird with red featherless head and dark single colored feathers. That would be the name of this bird. Now that's very long and very wordy and the problem with that is some, a lot of scientists and biologists couldn't agree on which characteristics were the most important. So during the 18th century this dude named Carolus Linnaeus decided that he had had enough with this rather poor naming system and he was going to develop a better system. It's called binomial nomenclature. Binomial nomenclature is a two-word naming system, and that's exactly what binomial nomenclature means. 
two words or two names naming system. Easy. In Linnaeus's system, each organism has a two-word scientific name that is often Latin-based, sometimes Greek. And the terms describe a major characteristic of the organism. And these names are written in a very specific way. Okay? They are written always in italics. So if you're typing it, a scientific name is always in italics. Always. The first letter of the first word is always capitalized and the second word is all lowercase. So it's pretty easy to remember. A couple of examples, Ursus arctus, which we're going to talk about on the next slide, is the grizzly bear or brown bear, and Homo sapiens, which are humans. So all of those, all, each of those means something, and when you use that word or that name with a biologist, they know exactly what you're talking about. Let's take a closer look at this system that Linnaeus came up with. As I said, he developed it in the late 1700s and it's still in use today. There's pretty much just been one major revision and that's because of the discovery of organisms that Linnaeus had no idea existed. And that's all those little microscopic critters because the microscope hadn't been invented yet or was just getting invented. Linnaeus's system is hierarchical meaning it consists of levels that build. Okay, Hierarchical comes from the word hierarchy or levels. Each level is called a taxon. So if I ask you what taxon or taxonomic group you're talking about, you think of what level. So let's take a look at these taxa or levels. We're going to follow the path of the grizzly bear as we go through this. So here's our little grizzly bear there in the star. So we're going to follow him, follow him down as we go through. It's a member of the kingdom Animalia. Animalia are heterotrophs. That is their main characteristic that we group them by. Now, animals that have a notochord or the beginnings of a spine at some point in their life are in the phylum chordata. Grizzly bears have a notochord and it develops into a spinal cord. This doesn't happen in all animals, as you're going to see later, but it does happen in grizzlies and all animals of the all animals like grizzlies. Of all the animals that have a notochord, grizzlies have fur, they nurse their young with milk produced by their mother. Can you know, can you guess what this class is? Yeah, if you guess mammals, you're right. This is the class mammalia. Other classes are aves or birds, fish, reptiles or reptilia, and amphibia. But we're going to stick with mammalia here. Next, grizzlies have sharp pointed teeth, so this puts them in the order carnivora. Sometimes words are misleading though. The word carnivore means meat eater, but not all members of this order are meat eaters, but they are all characterized by sharp pointed canine teeth, as well as some other characteristics. The next level is family. The bear is in the family Ursidae. Members of this family have small rounded ears, they have a short tail, they have non-retractable claws, and they walk on the whole sole of their feet, or their, we, call them, we call that plantigrade. That is the, the characteristic, they're plantigrade. We're plantigrade. We walk on the whole sole of our feet. The genus Ursus includes black, brown, and polar bears exclusively. Sloth bears, spectacled bears, sun bears, and giant pandas all have different characteristics than the other three. So they each have their own genus and they are separated out by those characteristics. For example, sloth bears have a shaggy coat and longer noses. Sun bears have naked soles on their feet. Other bears have hairy bottoms on their feet. Pandas are largely herbivorous with a thumb-like modification in their forepaws. So we see how the different animals get separated out in the genus. The species of Arctis refers specifically to brown, brown bears, which describes the grizzly. So if you wanted to talk intelligently to a biologist, you would refer to it as Ursus Arctis. 
And I think on the last slide I called that the polar bear. And yeah, no, I know it's not. And I don't know what I was thinking. And I don't feel like going back and changing it. But Ursus arctus, grizzly bear. Remembering and understanding the levels of classification help biologists compare and contrast different organisms, both living and extinct. As we discover new characteristics about organisms, that can change parts of their classification. This happened with the giant panda, for example. It was thought maybe it was a member of the raccoon family for a, for a while because it had a thumb-like digit on its forepaws. Scientists, though, have used DNA to help classify organisms more accurately. In the case of the giant panda, this helped biologists to learn that the giant panda is actually more closely related to bears than raccoons. And in here you can kind of see the little thumb-like projection that sets it apart, though, from the grizzly. However, the red panda is more related to skunks and weasels than it is to the giant panda. So we, we're getting more and more evidence and we're changing where some animals are classified based on that evidence. We also use clues to help us classify animals, fossils of animals that we find that are extinct. There are a lot of mnemonic devices that help people remember all of these different levels of classification. This is the one that I use and, and I will still use it to this day. And you kind of look at this and go, what is Miss Osterman talking about? Let me explain. How many stacks of cards do you see there? That's going to be really important. Okay? One, two, three, four, five. It's five stacks of cards. And they're giant cards. They're big. So here's my system. Keep, kingdom, piling, phylum, cards, class, on, order, five, family, giant, genus, species, stacks. Keep piling cards on five giant stacks. Kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus, species. Another one that I've heard people use is King Philip came over for good spaghetti. It doesn't matter which one you use, just f find one that you like and use it. Make up your own. If you come up with a really good one, I'd love to hear it. So what do you do next? Okay, you've got your notes written on the right hand side. Now I want you to take a minute and go back over your notes, kind of look over them, glance over them, draw a line across the bottom, all the way across, and I want you to summarize what this section was about in two or three sentences. What did you learn? What is, what is the main idea of this? Then I want you to go back again a third time and look at your notes and over on the left hand column write questions. Are there, are there things that are still not clear to you? Write those questions down. What kind of questions do you think I might ask on a quiz or a test? Remember our level 1, level 2, and level 3 questions? Mm -hmm. Write those down. Okay. You should be able to come up with easily three level 1 questions and two level 2 questions and one level 1 question. And your level 1 question, or your level 3 question, sorry, your level 3 question can't be, what if Linnaeus never came up with this classification system? Okay, Because somebody would come up with it. So that's kind of a silly question, but anyways. Make sure, too, that you bring your textbook to class because we're going to be talking about some of the things in the textbook. So, summarize, write questions, bring your notes to class, and have your textbook. And I will see you in class. Okay, guys? Bye.